Hello and welcome to the first part of a very special interview with a man who, as a broadcaster, writer and former government minister, has enjoyed a close relationship with the royal family for many years. His new biography of the Queen called Elizabeth, an intimate portrait, draws on his experiences with and around the royals, as well as extensive interviews with those who know them. This is unprecedented access, I think we can say. I am, of course, talking about Giles Brandreth, who I am delighted to say is here now and looking resplendent in a very on-brand jumper. Well, there Thank you, you are. for dressing the part. Which I think, on the other side of the Atlantic, we call a sweater. It is a sweater. It's well, a sweater, I'm, I'm, it's a jumper, it's a piece of knitwear. Solidly Australian, it's a jumper. Oh, is it a jumper there? <laughs> well, there we are. But, Giles, we've got so much to talk about, mm. lots in this, apart from the Queen's relationship with Prince Philip, to the troubles over Prince Andrew, of course. But what I want to ask first about this biography of Her Majesty is, what did you want to do differently to every other piece of literature out there about the Queen? Two things, I think. When I began writing this, I'd been working on writing a book about the Queen for a long time, thinking about it for a long time, in the hope it would be published for her centenary. She was a very old lady. I think a lot of us thought we would get a centenary. Uh, and I assumed we would, because her mother lived to be 100. So I'd been thinking about it, and I'd done a lot of work on it. But uh, two days before she died, uh, I happened to be, by chance, visiting Windsor Castle and the Royal Library there. And while I was giving this privileged access to this amazing library, I was looking at a prayer book that had belonged to Queen Elizabeth I. And of course, the extraordinary thing about our royal family is that it is our island story going back more than a thousand years. Elizabeth II, our longest reigning sovereign in this country, named after Elizabeth I, who was arrived at the time of William Shakespeare. And I was looking at this prayer book, this Psalter of hers. Can I just you presume you're not allowed to touch that, is it? No, nowadays you are allowed to touch these things. Wow. They used to have a time when you had to wear gloves. Yeah. But no, I was, I, it was very privileged access. And I was shown a painting there of Elizabeth I and a letter that Elizabeth I had written to her brother, who was also uh, a child of King Henry VIII. He was Edward VI. And she had sent this painting of herself to her brother. And in the letter she said, here is my outward likeness. If only I could show you my inward mind. And I suddenly thought, that's what I want to do with my book. I would like to be able to show the reader the inward mind of this extraordinarily famous person, the most painted person in history from, from life, one of the most photographed people in the story of the world, our, our queen for more than 70 years. We know what she looks like, but what was she really like? And then I thought, well, I've got something that maybe other people haven't got. I've, I've met her many times over the years, but I also keep a diary. And I first met the Queen on the 2nd of May, 1968. And I can tell you that because I keep a diary. Mm -hmm. And the Queen didn't remember everybody she met. She met tens of thousands of people. But everybody who ever meets the Queen, they remember it. And because I was then a student of 20, she was 42 years of age, I met the Queen and I went back and wrote it all up in my diary. And then every time I met the Queen, I wrote about it. So I had all these conversations that I'd had over 50 years with the, with the Queen. And the first time I met her, two things, and I was only 20, I was a student at Oxford University, and she came to visit the Union, the Debating Society. And I was introduced to her, presented to her, and the first thing I noticed was how the atmosphere changed when she came into the room. And I later realized, as I got to know her, that nobody was ever normal with the Queen. Yeah. There was always an invisible moat around her. Nobody could ever say, you know, talk to her like a, an ordinary woman, except perhaps her husband. And nobody could say to her husband, oh, Philip, do shut up, except the Queen. And she did. But there was this invisible moat around her, and the atmosphere visibly changed. And I thought, that's interesting. Here's a person who is very normal themselves, but when people meet her, they're not normal. And then I, I also, on that day, I reprimanded a fellow student who had walked up uh, across the courtyard in the rain, and he hadn't carried her umbrella. And I said, you should have carried the Queen's umbrella for her. She carried her own umbrella, and she's the Queen. And he said, oh, no, no, the Queen insists on carrying her own umbrella, because if somebody else carries it for her, rain trickles down her neck. <laughs> and that gave me an insight into the sort of small, the little details. So I thought, what I'm going to do is a book that reveals what the Queen was really like, gives you those intimate details. That's why it's an intimate biography. Now, you say intimate. Obviously, 
part of the royal appeal is the mystique, and it's something that they guard famously quite jealously. So were you worried about e delivering such a, a personal portrait? Well, it was famously said in the 19th century by a constitutional historian talking about the monarchy, do not let daylight in on magic. Because royalty is a curious phenomenon in our country. It is our history. It's a thousand years of history. But it is also mixed up with it, the idea of fairy tale. You know, it is Cinderella. We have kings and queens, princes and princesses. Uh, and part of it is the magic. But what I wanted people to know, really, was what the Queen was like. Because we only got a flavour, for example, of her sense of humour towards the end of her life. Yeah. Twelve years ago, famously, when the Olympics came to London, she did a sketch with James Bond, which was... And when, nobody saw that coming. Nobody saw that coming. Yeah. And when in fact she first turned round, people thought it must be a look-alike. It can't be exactly. her. Exactly. Yeah. And then recently, only earlier this year, for the Platinum Jubilee, she did a wonderful sketch with Paddington Bear. And she was such a good actress, it turned out. In fact, Dame Judi Dench, perhaps our, the most famous British actress, who I happened to be working with at the time, phoned me the next day and said, did you see the Queen last night? I said, I did. Wasn't she good? She said, she was too good. Yes, worrying. <laughs> worrying. She's going to be getting my work now. But yeah. the Queen had a great sense of humour, a wry sense of humour, and she loved... Uh, well, she, like many shy people, she was rather a good actress. When she was playing a part, she could play a part. In real life, she never played a part. That's the thing that struck me. I, I mean, over the years, I spent a lot of time with her, uh, and I, I spent time on parade with her when she was going on tours, uh, and she would be totally normal. So that everybody else was very anxious, but she would there, she'd open her handbag, she'd do her lipstick if she felt it was time to do it. She would just do it, even though people were watching. Uh, she never performed. She was herself. But when she was performing, she had great style. I, I asked her about the war years, the Second World War, when she was a girl, and she lived at Windsor Castle. And I said, what do you remember about the war? Uh, well, it's just making conversation. And she talked, first of all, about Winston Churchill, who was our leader during the war and who was a great friend of her father. And she told me, which I hadn't thought about before, that she thought that Winston Churchill was probably the only person, other than a member of the royal family, ever to stand in the middle of the balcony at Buckingham Palace. No other person, apart from a member of the royal family, had ever done that. And I said, well, well, but for you, what was the war like? Because she was a young teenager. What do you remember best? And she said, well, actually, probably the pantomimes. I said, the pantomimes. And at Christmas, they put on pantomimes at Windsor Castle. She and her sister, and their master of a local school, put on these Christmas shows. I've seen all those costumes on display yeah. at Windsor Castle. It's amazing, isn't it? And she yeah. loved doing that. Yeah. And she had fun doing that. And the Queen could do the most wonderful impressions. And not just of, of people, but uh, she could do a very good impression of Concord, the aeroplane, landing over Windsor Castle. Excuse me? The aeroplane landing over the... Uh, why did they build Windsor Castle? Have you actually so witnessed the, airport? the Queen doing a doing Concord, impression of Concord? Concord landing. <laughs> it was very noisy. Uh, and a friend I of mean, mine... I mean, that's a Britain's Got Talent yeah, sort she, of sketch. sketch. She yeah. was that gifted. Well, yeah. if you saw her with Paddington Bear, you know what a gifted performer she was. So my idea with the book was really to show the Queen in the round. But it was to do something more serious than that, because at the time of her funeral, I was privileged to be part of the BBC team uh, covering this. And I went every day to be outside Buckingham Palace in the studio. And there was a, this was an event that attracted worldwide attention. More leaders, princes, presidents, prime ministers came yes. to London for her funeral than had ever gathered in one city before at any time. And tens of thousands of people came to Buckingham Palace to lay flowers and poems and Paddington Bears. And I began to think, why are these people coming here? She is our longest reigning monarch. She clearly was a remarkable person. But what was it about her? And I came to the conclusion about, after about 10 days that we live in a very dark world and people were watching the horrors of Ukraine on television in the evening. And here was somebody who was, was good, was consistent, was kind, was somebody who kept their word, who made promises in the 1940s that here we are, all these years later, nearly 80 years later, fulfilled those promises. She was an exemplar of goodness. And I thought, people are reaching out for that. Mm. And I thought, now what made her this unique person? So that's what the book tries to do, explore what made her special. Mm. But you were somebody who had more access and, and, and more of a relationship with the, the most people. Was there anything that surprised you 
when you were putting this book together? How funny she was, mm. how real she was, how she lived in the moment, how um, she was happy. Um, I think she was happy because she was driven. She was driven by duty. She was sustained by faith. That was the most important thing to her in life. She once said to me, out of the blue, we were in church at the time, and I mentioned something about the Lord's Prayer, Our Father, which art in heaven, and she said, sometimes the Lord's Prayer is all you need. And that mattered to her. Faith mattered to her. I discovered there always at photographs, or there used to be a film of her on a Sunday morning going to church. What we didn't know was that that was the second time she went to church. She'd already been privately earlier mm. in the day. So her faith mattered to her. Uh, oh, there were so many things that surprised me, that she was so consistent. I, I, I said to one of her private secretaries once, she seems quite conservative, with a small c. And he said, yes. But I think, he said, that's a matter of policy for her. She believes in going at the pace of the slowest person in the kingdom, so that nobody should ever feel left behind. So she had unusual values. That's right, and she had, well, and very consistent values. And it was her uh, devotion to protocol, to tradition, to institutions, that she had famously one of the longest marriages in royal history. Yes, so I, I reveal in the book, it, it's often said that when she met uh, her husband-to-be, who was a, a, a Prince Philip of Greece in the 1930s, he was about 18 and she was 13, and they famously met at Dartmouth Naval College. And it's often said, indeed it was said in many of the obituaries for her and for her husband, that that's when they first met. It wasn't. Mm -hmm. They were cousins. They were both great-great-grandchildren of Queen Victoria and they'd known one another as children. They would certainly have met before. And it said that she only ever had eyes for him. Well, as I discovered and I revealed, um, she had eyes for other people as well. In fact, I, I'm able to quote some, some letters and some diaries of the time where it's clear there were one or two other rather good-looking young men that she thought um, could possibly be and even husband material. Why do you think uh, it worked? i tell you why it worked. In fact, I think Prince Philip told me why it worked without ex saying it. Prince Philip was very interested in flying. He could be quite contradictory. He was in the Navy, but he said if he'd be left to his own devices, he'd been a, a, an airman. And he showed me a, a book by a man called Saint uh, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, who wrote the book The Little Prince. And in uh, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, it said, love consists not necessarily in gazing into one another's eyes, but in looking in the same direction. Mm -hmm. That's lovely. And Prince Philip and the Queen shared values. They had the same outlook in life. Look up, look out, don't look out, don't look in, get on with the job. They were of their generation, too. There are no photographs anywhere in the world to be seen of the King, uh, of uh, uh, Prince Philip and the Queen holding hands. They, they weren't, that's, that wasn't their style. Prince Philip showed me another quotation by Napoleon when he said, if you want to understand what a man is like, this is Napoleon, you should look at what the world was like in the year that man turned 21. And Prince Philip turned 21 in 1942, and the Queen turned 21 in 1947. And they were people of that generation. Uh, that wartime generation, many people call it uh, the best generation. Mm. And he certainly was a, a war hero, and she had those values. But I think what was remarkable, too, about them is that they were happy because they believed in what they were doing. They were capable of accepting change, but they were different people. He was very dynamic, go ahead, and she was very uh, conservative. She was also, um, there was a matter of policy with her. I went to a, a show with them once, and he was, it was, it was something called the Royal Variety Show. It's to raise money for charity. And if he didn't like an act, he'd be muttering about it, you know, looking at his thing, saying, oh, God, not Elton John again. <laughs> uh, but the Queen was very even. And I noticed during the show, he'd be applauding if he really enjoyed it, and just sitting there, if he didn't enjoy it, he'd just, uh, <laughs> you know, checking his watch. But the Queen consistently applauded the same amount of time, almost in a second, for every act. When the interval came, I said, well, Your Majesty, you seem to enjoy everything. She said, well, I did. He said, you seem to enjoy everything equally. 
did you, Your Majesty? Well, perhaps not. She said, but I said you applauded, or just the same. She said, well, yes, you see, we're on television, and their families might have been watching, and oh. I didn't want... Exactly. Yeah. She was incredibly even-handed. Yeah. When you... Occasionally, I, I would talk about... Because one of the protocols with the Queen is you're not supposed to initiate the conversation. They've got to lead the conversation. Her real passions in life, what she liked talking about, were dogs and horses. I know very little about dogs and horses. So, uh, but she was quite relaxed, so I would often initiate the conversation. And sometimes one would talk about children or grandchildren. W what I noticed was that when she talked about her children or grandchildren, she never picked out anybody. She used to go in descending order. So she talked about the oldest first, then the next oldest, next, and similarly with the grandchildren. So then it was sort of, seemed to be in her DNA to be totally fair. Well, and you also talk about her, um, you know, obviously it's said that people become more right-wing and more conservative as they, as they get older, but you seem to think the Queen became less conservative in her views. Yes, I think she did. And I think, well, somebody, one of her private secretaries said to me that she'd become more informal, looser, more relaxed as she grew older, partly after her mother died. Right. Uh, she loved her parents. That, totally. That, her happy childhood was central to her being, and she really believed in family for that reason. She adored her father. Mm. Uh, he was, as it were, the man in her life, and he died very young. And, of course, she loved her mother. Her mother lived a long time. Um, but uh, I think that she wouldn't really do anything that she felt her mother would not have approved of. And one of the Queen's private secretaries said to me, I don't think she'd have done that thing with James Bond if uh, her mother had still been alive. It's fascinating, that, because how old would she have been when she did that? <laughs> exactly. You know, old enough to make any I, I'm the Queen. Yeah, exactly. Well, I think the, I think the Queen was about 80 yeah. when her mother died. Yeah. Um, how, how bizarre is that? But it shows you we're still we're always aware of her parents. But also parents. how strong that, that tradition and that uh, con consistency of duty and all of those things mattered to her. I think the thing to remember is that these people who do it, like the Queen, and indeed like the present King, uh, they believe in it. Yeah. You couldn't do it if you didn't believe in it. And it's, it's, it's a duty. She wrote, the Queen wrote an interesting diary herself of her parents' coronation back in 1936, uh, when she was a little girl, only 10 years of age. So she followed her parents' um, coronation, and she wrote an account of it. And in this account of it, she talks about being in a carriage. And she writes, this is a little girl, at first it was very jolty, but gradually we got used to it. Oh, my goodness, what a metaphor. And it, that's, <laughs> I think, what she felt about yeah. being sovereign. At first it was very jolty, but gradually we got used to it. And she said, this is a job for life. And it was a job for life. And what uh, amused me uh, over the years is people kept saying, do you think she'll abdicate? Will she have... And anybody who had studied the Queen for five minutes, let alone for a lifetime, would know there was never any possibility of her yeah. abdicating. She committed herself, age 21, to a lifetime of service. That was a commitment. And it was also, it was a duty, but it was a joy. It was what she was there to do. And at the time of the coronation, she was a person of great faith. Holy oil was administered. And there was a moment in the coronation when it is administered that she wouldn't have televised and it was the first coronation to be on television. And there was a sort of private moment, and it was the most spiritual moment. And so it was like a, an obligation from God. Mm. She was of the generation of my parents. My father would kneel by the bedside to say his prayers. The queen would kneel by the bedside to say her prayers. Then she would get into bed, and she would then take up her diary, and with a pencil, with a rubber on the end in case she had second thoughts, and keep her diary. So well, I, now there's something we'd all like to read. We would all like. Yeah. I bet <laughs> yeah. you, though, what's interesting is I bet you it's totally positive. But I, no, I, I suspect, I like to think it's full of wry asides yes. about prime ministers. And because well, it's so interesting that we don't know her personal views on any of those no. things. No. I, I, mean, I hope it gives the account, which I know to be true because the only other person in the room who's still alive told me the story. Margaret Thatcher. 
um, one of our longest serving British Prime Ministers, our first woman Prime Minister. Indeed. When you, when you become the Prime Minister in this country, you go every week when Parliament is sitting to have a meeting with the King or Queen to unburden yourself and to keep them up to speed. And the first time Mrs. Thatcher had become Prime Minister, she went to Buckingham Palace to meet the Queen. And it is traditional to bow, if you're a man, or curtsy if you're a woman, in front of the Sovereign. And the equerry, taking uh, Mrs. Thatcher to meet the Queen for the first time, said, Prime Minister, have you got your curtsy ready? And she said, oh, yes, I'm completely ready with that. And they went into the room, and the equerry said, Your Majesty, the Prime Minister, your Majesty. He then backed out of the room, or was about to, and uh, as he was backing out, he saw Mrs. Thatcher curtsy. She curtsied right to the ground, beautiful curtsy, and stayed there. She couldn't get up. Oh, wow. She had curtsied so low, so deeply, that she was stuck on the floor. And, and she's very lucky that gravity didn't well, go the full... I think she was sort of... It was like that. The Aquarius came to one side. Strong thighs, Mrs Thatcher. The Aquarius yeah. came one side. He couldn't lift her on his own. Oh, my goodness. So the Queen came the other side. I don't think this featured in the crown. No, it uh, did not. I, well, exactly. Um, uh, lots of things from some of my earlier books, I think, have featured in the crown. And I think they'll be furious that I this book has come out too I late for that. I think you might be getting a call from Peter Morgan when this comes out. Well. I think she also met an extraordinary amount of American presidents. Um, what do you know about her relationships with, with them? Are there any standout moments? Well, what, is, what all the prime ministers and separately the presidents will have felt with her when they were alone with her is that you knew this was somebody you could totally trust, who had met everybody, seen everything, and listened, and could be a sounding board. Um, and you also knew, which a politician loves, that it's not going to leak. It's just not going to leak, which is fantastic. Uh, there were presidents of, as it were, her father's generation who meant a lot to her, somebody like President Eisenhower. Mm -hmm. And I quote in the book, this wonderful correspondence. This is after President Eisenhower had been on a, on a visit and had stayed, I think, with the Queen up in Balmoral at her Scottish home. And she suddenly, she saw him on television, a news item, and she remembered, oh, goodness, I promised the president my recipe for drop scones. He particularly liked my recipe, and Mamie didn't seem to have made them. Uh, so she wrote in her big, loopy handwriting, you know, dear Mr. President, hope all is well with you and the children and the grandchildren. I've just remembered, I didn't send you that recipe. Now, and then she wrote out the recipe. She, of course, had a special feeling for Ronald Reagan uh, because of their shared love of horses. Um, and there's some marvellous pictures of them going out riding yes. together. Yeah. So that, and she was, a, what is interesting is the people around her may have been stuffy and formal, but she really wasn't. So for example, there was a famous encounter between her uh, and Mrs. Obama. And the Obamas came over, and Mrs. Obama, who was quite tall, and the Queen, who was quite small, they were in conversation, and they moved across the room, and sort of instinctively, Mrs. Obama put her arm around her. Yes. And people thought, oh, my God, you're not allowed to touch the Queen. And indeed, her mother did once complain in Australia, no touching the exhibits, please. Um, you're not supposed to touch. Uh, we did have a prime minister who got into deep water with that one. Yeah, well, you've got to be careful. So, but Mrs. Obama put her arm around the Queen. The Queen didn't object. In fact, what people didn't see is that Mrs. Uh, the Queen reciprocated yeah. and put her arm around Mrs. Obama. And Mrs. Obama later said, actually, the truth is we were just two exhausted ladies and we've been talking about standing in our feet, on our feet all day and the heels hurting us. But you now, know... Y yeah, but, but sorry. That doesn't ring true to me. Really? I think, well, I think, well, I mean, I'm sure that's what happened. And I'm sure that's what Mrs. Obama said. But I think that's the Queen being sweet. Because the Queen was used to standing up all day. The Queen quite, point. quite yeah. liked standing up. Meetings of the Privy Council, which is the group of ministers where the Queen gathers, have always been held standing up. A lot of the Queen's meetings were held standing up. She was very good at standing up and moving from one foot to the other. I went a lot of trips with her, and she moved from one foot. She spent a lot of her life standing up, so she would have coped quite well with standing up. Fascinating. So I think she was just saying that to be... And you know, at one of these Privy Council meetings, these are all the ministers, um, the Queen was there presiding, and somebody's mobile phone, their cell phone, went off, one of the minister's cell phones went off, and the minister was terribly embarrassed. And the queen said, oh, you better answer that. Was, I'm so sorry, she said, you better answer it. It could be somebody important. 
and that was the Queen speaking. That is brilliant. Now, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but what, what, what I wanted to say was what struck me when you were talking about recipes for drop scones and sort of like, you know, intimate arms around each other huddles. She had this amazing reputation, the Queen, for her diplomacy skills and, and you know, the, the power of the soft diplomacy of the monarchy. But in her personal life, she was often criticised for not being the greatest mother of all time. She was criticised a lot over the years. We remember her now as a, a grandmother figure. She died at age 96. People of my children and grandchildren's generation only knew her as this sweet old lady. Yes. But during her, in her younger days, she was often criticised uh, for her way of speaking, for her manner, etc. She took a lot of criticism over the years and I think was conscious of it. One of the criticisms that definitely hurt her, and I know this from having discussed it openly with her husband, was criticism of, the, of them as parents. By Charles, by, quite By often. a few years ago, mm. by Prince Charles, as he then was, mm. now our king. And I think this came about really, in the 1980s, because at the time, Prince Charles was in a bad place. And he gave an interview and helped with a book in which he appeared to say that he felt you know, unloved as a, a child, that he felt imprisoned in his perambulator, that he he'd hated school. Yeah. Uh, but all the people in writing this book and working on it over many years, and, and a book I wrote earlier, I met people of the Queen and Prince Philip's generation who told me they were wonderful parents. They were very hands-on, much more so than people of their generation would normally have been in their class. Um, and I think what distressed them, the Queen and Prince Philip, was that it should be made public. The Queen never gave an interview. Uh, the Duke of Edinburgh gave interviews about subjects that were he was supporting. But uh, their style was not. I mean, I know, for example, that he would have been appalled at um, uh, Prince Harry and Meghan giving an interview to Oprah. Right. It's not something he would have dreamt of doing. His line was, don't talk about yourself. He actually said this to his children. But you seem to say in the book that the Queen was a little bit more sort of resigned to it, circumspect, that, 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 that television nonsense. Oh, yes. I mean, he, um, the Duke of Edinburgh certainly would have thought it was ill-advised, because once you answer one question, they'll ask another question. And it opens What's questions. to be gained yeah. by it? Uh, he also, again, think of their generation. They belong to a generation where having a stiff upper lip and not saying anything was a virtue. Now it's a touchy-feely generation. It's totally different. But he would have thought that's ill-advised. His view was, don't talk about yourself. Don't think about yourself. Mm. Break the mirror. Stop looking at yourself. Look out. You'll be happier that way. He was, he was of the view. He was a serious person, part of him. He liked Jung. And Jung said, uh, this is the, the psychologist Jung, uh, people who look up and out and think about other people, have interests in life, are going to be happier than those who are introspective. Now, the Queen was much more relaxed about that sort of thing. As you say, some things are better to, to not know. I'm sure there's a lot of stuff she doesn't want to know about Prince Andrew, but how do we solve a problem like that for the royal family? How was it his involvement with the late sex offender, Jeffrey Epstein? He's denied all wrongdoing, obviously, but did have to settle a court case yeah. with one of Epstein's victims. Um, how do you think that affected the Queen, and especially at the time of her life that yes. it came along? What the Queen was very good at doing was being a sovereign and a monarch and having that role, which she was born to, and being a wife and a mother. And they were the same person, but she was able to separate the roles quite clearly. Her children and grandchildren were very aware that she had both roles. In fact, it's quite interesting. Sometimes I've heard Prince Harry speak about his grandmother, and he usually refers to her as the Queen first. Yeah. that he served her as a queen, as well as her being a grandmother. So everyone was aware of that, and indeed her children and grandchildren, meeting her for the first time of the day, would well, curtsy or bow to her. And I remember uh, Meghan on the Oprah interview saying that, that she couldn't get her head around yeah. that with Prince Harry explaining yes. that to her. Yeah. And you've got to bear in mind that this is a family that has been doing this for a thousand years. So it's absolutely inbred and very strange, unless you're used to it. So for the queen, it was relatively easy. And Andrew, of course, was her son. And she loved her son completely. And whenever, over the years, even before the Epstein uh, story 
there were times when Andrew seemed to be getting a bit of flack, bad press. And she would go out of her way to show her support for him, to be photographed with him, or even to give him an, an honor that was within her gift to, to salute his work. Is it, is it because he was reportedly her favorite? Yes, mm. that's, that's what people would say. But I would say, having seen her in action, that she was meticulous about not having favorites. Mm. Um, but she did spend more time with some people than others. So for example, I know she spent a lot of time with Sophie Wessex, who is the wife of her youngest son. So by, by spending time with someone, you know, watching TV with them, having meals with them, you get close, close to them. Um, she loved all her children. She certainly loved Prince Andrew. And I know <coughs> that when the time came, when this story blew up, and it was clear that he was damaging the royal family and the institution, the Queen didn't really hesitate. Uh, she got together with her, the, the next two, the, her heir and the, the, the next heir beyond, and they agreed that this it wasn't working, that actually Prince Andrew, there was too much mm. bad publicity attached to this, it was damaging the institution. And from that meeting to the decision being taken was only a, a few days, um, and he had to step down. At the same time, the Queen wanted it to be known that she, of course, loved her son and was photographed, I think, the very day afterwards, out riding with him in Windsor Park. And during the COVID pandemic, when people were isolated, she saw a great deal of him because he was then a private citizen, but she was still, he was still the son. Yeah. Um, so I think she was, able to, she was able to do that. Of course, it would have been a sadness to her, um, because who wants to see your, your son facing, facing that kind of publicity? But uh, in his statement, all her children gave a statement after her death. And there was a word that Prince Andrew used in his statement talking, and he thanked her in different roles as, her, as, as, as the sovereign, mm. as the, you know, the queen serving the country, the family of the country, and as, as a mother. And he thanked her for the confidence that she had shown in him. And I think she will have accepted his word. You know, she'd have realized it was damaging for the royal family, where you have to step back from your public duties. That's the way it is. Um, uh, but she will have, he, he told her, nothing happened, I do assure you. And she will have accepted, and that's what I think he means by, thank you for the confidence you showed in me. Perhaps she believed him, because you uncovered a rather mischievous fact that mother and son have one thing in common, and that they don't sweat. <laughs> well, yes. I mean, the, the, I, I learned that from um, a reporter who um, traveled around across the world with the Queen, who always went at an even pace and certainly did not perspire. And that was one of the lines that um, Prince Andrew took. Exactly. I know that he told his story to his mother in full. She asked to hear it. And at the end of it, uh, her first initial response, she was very good at not saying things. Her initial response was simply, intriguing. So he, he had to go and see his mother, the Queen, and tell her the full scope of what he was being accused of? Yes. You say it like that, as though, ooh. Um, this is, um, it was, I mean... It's pretty incendiary what Victoria, uh, Virginia Jufre was saying. Absolutely. Yeah. But he, he will have told her what, was, yeah. what it was all about. I mean, they were a mother and a son. And she will have had to cope with the fact, this is my boy, and also, I am the queen, this is an institution, this is the way our country operates. Mm. Uh, it is a value, I believe in it. And she took the decision, with others, um, that the right thing was for him to step back. Mm. But at the same time, she's not going to disown her own son. So that when he came on the day of her father, her, the memorial service for her husband and wanted to accompany her, she will have accepted that. I mean, mm. actually, anyone who's been a mother, I think, can see the position that she was in. Mm. And anyone who has seen her work as the sovereign can also see the position she was in. So she tried to serve the monarchy as best she could and look after the interests of her family. But what is interesting for, for me with this book is that the Queen was able to take the long view. We all obsess about Harry and Meghan, about Andrew. Oh, oh, oh. The Queen had been through this 
in every decade of her life. When she was a little girl, there was the whole scandal of her uncle and uh, Wallace Simpson. Yeah. That, was the, that was a real story, and it actually rocked the monarchy, and the king abdicated. Then, after the war, there was scandal involving her sister, mm -hmm. her younger sister, whom she loved, uh, who wanted to marry an older man who was also a divorcee and quite unsuitable. I mean, he was you know, 14 or so years older um, than Princess Margaret. She was a teenager when it all began. It was completely unsuitable. It wasn't going to happen. But she, she had seen all these things. Now, it's nothing new. Mm, having programs like this, writing books like mine, making film shows like The Crown, uh, you're not going to get bogged down in that. You really aren't. It does annoy you at times. The Duke of Edinburgh, for example, there was a fine film made with Helen Mirren playing the part of the Queen. And I said, have you seen this? It's a very popular film to the Duke of Edinburgh. He said, of course I've seen it. He said, but I understand they have the Queen crying. I said, yes. He said, well, the Queen doesn't cry. Never? He said, that doesn't make her, he seems interesting, doesn't make her unfeeling. He immediately knew that's what you'd say. Oh, never, never. Of course, she may well have cried. I don't know. But she was not given to crying. That wasn't her style. It doesn't mean to say you're unfeeling. She, he said, but the press always want to see her crying. Said, Show us how you feel. So, for example, they wanted to illustrate that she was more feeling, felt, felt more about her, the Royal Yacht Britannia than about her own children. And so there were pictures taken when this boat, this lovely ship that she did love, and she went on many tours with, and it used to go on summer holidays on it, where every summer holiday she showed a James Bond film. She was very keen on James <laughs> Bond's film. She told, oh, it's all coming together now. And, and yeah. she said, until they came so loud. Yeah. Anyway, um, she complained that the noise of the films was too loud. And she said, yeah, yeah, on television it's all very loud, but I can't understand what they're saying. That's by the by. Um, uh, there were pictures taken which appeared to show her crying. And he said, of course, Give them what they want. They think she was crying. He said, we were all crying. The wind was terrible. It was a very cold day. <laughs> really, that sort of thing infuriated them. She, I think, just, just took it uh, in her stride. We do have to wrap there. It's do been we? absolutely I'm wonderful. I'm totally ready to the stories I've prepared. I know. You've got to get this book. There's so much amazing information in it. A reminder that Giles Brandreth's book, Elizabeth, an Intimate Portrait, is out on the 8th of December, published by Michael Joseph. That is all we have time for. I'm going to go to the pub with Giles now. You can join us again tomorrow for part two, when we will hear more fascinating revelations from Giles's book. See you then.